Hello. How are we going, guys? Okay, we're just about ready to start. Um, I'm going to remind you now because I will forget at the end. But uh, 6 p.m. drinks, boat builders yard. I'm sure you all probably already knew that. It's the most important event of the day. <laughs> uh, for the networking, that is, not the booze. Um, so, welcome. Thanks for coming to the talk. Um, my name is Chris Wright. I'm the founder and managing director of uh, Surprise Attack Games, um, indie label based here in Melbourne. Um, and I have uh, Marla, if you want to. Hi, my name is Marla. I work with Chris as marketing manager at Surprise Attack Games. Um, been in the industry for about 10 years now, previous to coming to Surprise Attack, um, which is an indie publishing label. I was at Nintendo and previous that to PlayStation. So, yep. yeah. Yep. And I'm Felix. Um, I work with Surprise Attack as a scout, and I also run a studio called Polytron. Awesome. Um, so yes, yeah, so a lot of di uh, different experience. And before um, setting up Surprise Attack six years ago, I uh, was a senior marketing guy at THQ, running marketing for Asia Pacific, and then uh, marketing for the two studios that were here in Australia. Um, that six years ago were shut down, but that gave me the chance essentially to set up Surprise Attack and, and follow the journey of the Aussie industry essentially of uh, independence that we've built over the last six years. So it's, it's awesome to be at GCAP every year and, and think back to six years ago when I set up the company and see how things have changed. Um, cool, so we are doing a talk today about positioning, um, officially subtitled, how to discover and amplify what is remarkable about your game, but really it's why should anyone give a fuck about your game? Um, so this is a talk we give a lot and, uh, and typically we give it as a two hour interactive workshop where we actually get you to do a bunch of these exercises on your game with our assistance. Um, we're not doing that today because we only have an hour. Um, but I encourage you all to download the free workbook that we put out. It's at this bit.ly link. Um, it's a Word doc. Um, you will be able to work through that workbook. It explains a lot of the exercises in it. Um, you can share that with anybody, just please keep our copyright on, on that and credit us, but we like to spread it out and, and, and spread this technique as far and wide as we can. Uh, and I'll put that link up again at, at the end, and of course you can hit me up on Twitter about it. So there is a lot to get through in this hour, it will be quite intense. Um, don't worry about <laughs> taking everything away. Um, if you get the workbook afterwards, um, you'll be able to sort of remind yourself a, a lot of it. Um, what I would say is that when you get back to your studios, please, please, please go through the process we're going to teach you today. Um, it's extremely valuable. It's critical that every developer does it. It's as important as a design document um, or an art direction or any of the other sort of strategic things you do on your game. Okay, so we're going to rattle through a bunch of this um, and then we'll have hopefully time for questions at the end. Um, Okay, so what is positioning? Positioning, officially, this is the description. There's a, a book from the 1970s um, entitled Positioning. Uh, it was a concept that, that developed in advertising around that time um, where ads sort of went from just explaining the features of the product to starting to try and own a space, right? So if you think about modern advertising today, think about something like supermarkets. Um, Woolworths owns the word fresh. Right, so they positioned themselves as a supermarket around fresh. Coles doesn't really have a position, but it's been trying to do the price positioning. Hey, like we're cheaper, right? So it's positioning as, you know, we're this kind of thing. And then the audience, this is what the audience think of you when they think about the category of product, right? Um, within game development and within marketing, this is the first step in the marketing process. Before you start making trailers, before you start designing logos, before you start pitching people, you need to do a positioning exercise. You'll probably do it two or three times during the course of your game. Um, anything you do without doing the strategy part is just noise, it's just sort of tactics without strategy essentially is just activity, right? It's not going in the direction you want to do. And there's three things that you want to get out of the positioning process. Uh, number one, you want to understand how to be different, how to stand out from the crowd. Number two, this process helps you understand the real value of your game. Um, helps you think about it in ways that are beyond how many levels, how many characters, how many mechanics are there in the game. And actually, how is someone going to engage with your game? And um, finally, this is extremely useful for developing your key messages and then your elevator pitch. And that will come on to each of these in, in turn during the course of the presentation. Um, so, differentiation. Uh, this is your standard coffee R. This is a shop from a US supermarket. 
Um, every product on those shelves essentially does the same thing. Coffee is basically a commodity. Um, they all have caffeine in them. And yet each of those brands is there trying to get a consumer to buy them. If this was games, imagine that aisle going on several miles into the distance, and that's a week, right? And if you're talking about the App Store, you can go another 20 miles in the distance, and that's a week, right? Um, games are a commodity. Fun is a commodity. Good mechanics are a commodity. These things are not meaningful to the audience because there are so many of them just coming down the chain that a fun game doesn't mean anything. Being an indie doesn't mean anything anymore. Six years ago when I started the business, I could get stories on major websites about three guys that used to work at a big studio setting up their own studio. Like that was news. And you could pitch a game on the idea that this was a dream that the person had had and they worked in their bedroom for three years and now they had a game. Now that's wallpaper, right? So you have to find something to be able to stand out and it gets harder every day as more and more people are trying to do that. Here's one week of games on Steam. This is from June of this year. It's worse now. Yes, yeah. much worse now. Um, probably twice as bad now in many ways. There's 155 games there. Um, this does not include the DLCs that were launching that week. It doesn't include the demos. It doesn't include the movies, um, the soundtracks, um, et cetera. Um, we are so far beyond the point when people would actually track what's coming out each week because there's too much content. So, so the good news is beyond about 15 to 20 games a week, the increasing volume number of games doesn't make a lot of difference. Like we're past the point now where people care like, oh, I wonder what's out this week, right? But the bad news is that you are one of an increasing number of products that are hitting the shelves. Um, and only a handful of them will stand out. If you don't do the work to figure out how you're gonna stand out, you, you certainly won't. Um, differentiation also can be a very powerful marketing technique. Um, obviously this is from a big company and, and you uh, are all small indies primarily, but the principles are the same. Um, so many of you will remember these ads that Apple ran. Um, this whole campaign was about differentiation. It was about saying, here's one thing, we're something else. Hello, I'm a Mac. And I'm a PC, and it's time to play Choose a Vista. Well, what's going on? Well, Vista comes in six different versions, and I, I don't know which to choose. I could spend a lot of money and get a version that has a lot of stuff I don't need, or spend too little and get stuck with one that doesn't do very much at all. Hmm, well, Macs just have one version with all the stuff you need already. Well, that's boring. This is fun. Come on, big operating system, big operating system. Daddy needs an upgrade. Didn't you make this? It's a really good advertising campaign. The whole strategy was to differentiate. At the time, Mac didn't have a big share of the home computer market. It has a lot bigger share now. And these ads, are, and that strategy is part of that. Um, and they own this idea of user-friendly technology. Like it's been the Apple brand for that whole time. And it allows them to charge massive premiums and to have passionate fans. And it is unassailable position. You know, you see Microsoft sometimes trying to do ads about hey, people using technology in real life, but like they cannot possibly impact Apple's hold on them. Um, another great example from our industry on how positioning is so important is the last three Nintendo consoles. This is the point that Marla has to pretend she's not here. Um, <laughs> so the Wii was a positioning, was a marketing success, okay? Um, as a console, it was old technology, it wasn't, um, amazing design, the motion controls actually weren't very good, the vast majority of the products on the platform were shovelware, right? At least the, the third party stuff, right? And yet it sold so successfully, um, one of the top sort of three or four best selling consoles of all time. And the reason for that was it wasn't developed from a technological standpoint, it was developed from a positioning standpoint. Um, Nintendo realized that there was a whole audience that no one was tapping into that had grown up playing snares and nares and were, were willing to play games, but no one was making something for them. And they built their console around those people. Um, when we first had meetings with them, they told us the console was going to be for people from 5 to 95. And we said, you're insane. <laughs> and then they brought it out and you're like, oh, holy shit, they were not insane. They were really smart. <laughs> Turns out. Right? Turns, Turns out, out they Turns knew out. what they were doing, yeah. right? Um, very, very successful, right? And all the ads, everything was focused behind that positioning. 
The Wii U, on the other hand, I don't think anyone knows who that's for or what that positioning was, right? Um, people didn't even know if was it a, uh, an accessory, was it a new version of the console, or what was it, because the naming was so confusing. Everything was focused around the gamepad, but no one really understood like why you would even want that, right? And there's still no games that actually use the gamepad well. Okay, very similar to the 3DS, where no one get, cared about the 3D. So that positioning of like, hey, we've got the gamepad and the screen, no one wanted. It was a massive positioning mistake. Killed that off, in comes the Switch. Another great positioning victory for Nintendo. They own the idea of a hybrid portable and, and home console um, that can run powerful machines, powerful games, and they cannot make enough of them. Okay, but in each case, the technology actually isn't anything new. They're using existing technology and packaging it up for people with a very clear position or a very muddy position and the results being different. So again, obviously big companies, lots of money, but from a principal point of view, getting your position right can make or break your product. Okay, okay so um, obviously the key is you wanna find your difference, um, but then we also looked at um, what does real value mean? So this is the cliche of the kids here having more fun with the box than the toy that was inside this box. What we're looking at here is that what's um, important here is not the features of the toy itself, but how the kids are going to, like the imagination and the play that the kids will have, the experiences that they're gonna have with the product um, that they're buying. And that's what we're trying to tap into when we look at real value. It's that emotional end experience um, that the consumer is gonna have. So let's have a look at uh, an example. This is the exact same game. Um, and we're gonna have a quick look at it being marketed uh, very differently. So let's have a look on the N64. Oh, oh, oh yeah, sorry. Technology. あの、世界的なスパイ映画。007の興奮がそのまま Aside from Rumble Controller, um, what do we think they were saying? Uh, what, how do we think we're trying to position this game when they launched it on N64? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, if I play this game, I will be at least as cool as those dudes who are, are at least as cool as James Bond himself. Yeah. Exactly. So this ad is telling you that by buying this game, you can have that experience and be Bond. Oh. No. Okay, let's, while I work the technology, let's have a look um, at how it was repositioned um, when it released on Wii. Exact same game. Oh, no, it hates us. Sorry. She looks like a little arrow. Okay. Muy bien, chicos. Vamos, granada. Soy Bono. Tengo la pistola de oro. Golden haya vuelto. Enfréntate a tus amigos solo para Wii Nintendo DS. Okay, so that is the Spanish version of the ad. <laughs> Very big market in Spain. But obviously you can see here that um, when they released it on Wii, um, they'd had a bit of time to reflect. And we, what, how they're repositioning it here is remembering back that Actually, what we all remember when we played Bond originally on the N64 wasn't being Bond itself. It was those experiences of playing with our friends. Obviously, we have seen this ad, um, or this style of ad taken with, um, through Nintendo's advertising with a, few, a little bit more diversity in the ads that followed. Um, but what the, how they were repositioning it here was they were able to reflect back and see the, the actual true value of the game in our minds as players and as consumers was the experiences that we shared um, as we were playing this game and not actually being Bond itself. Oh, elevator pitches, this is me. One second. Move. 
Okay, so elevator pitches. pitches. Um, the dreaded elevator pitch, the moment that you have 10 seconds to talk to a stra total stranger about the game that you're making. Uh, everybody stresses over this, and for good reason. Obviously, it feels like a lot of pressure on you in a moment. Um, but with something like a positioning workshop and actually analyzing how your game is different and what the real value is, elevator pitches can become quite a bit easier, I'd say, at least. Um, oh, God, how do I work this? <laughs> This. Okay, so elevator pitches are seen, we like to see them as uh, permission. So really what it is, is permission, like that moment of permission to tell someone more about your game. So think of it as uh, uh, a moment that you have uh, to entice someone into asking you more about what you're pitching to them. Um, so it should be tantalizing, maybe? Tantalizing, yeah. is that a word? Yeah, and the key thing is it can be a total lie. Yeah, it, yeah, totally, it, like 100%. It, yeah, it yeah. doesn't have to represent everything about the game. It can exaggerate, it can abstract, because it's all its job is to do is to earn you the right to tell them more and explain that, yes, I said it was that, but actually let me explain what I really meant, right? <laughs> Capture the imagination is what you're wanting to do. It can be a total lie, it feels... Yeah. Anyway, it's Capture fine, it's fine. Yeah, 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 you're fine, you're fine, you're fine. We're, we're, yeah. Okay, so uh, the classic elevator pitch has three aspects. One, what is your game about? Two, what makes your game special? And three, can you describe it easily so that someone who has never played a game like your game can understand it, right? That one's actually really, really important. A lot of people leave that one out. We tend to, as developers, kind of forget that there is a much larger audience. We know our core audience, right? We know sort of like the person that will know our game right off the bat but have we described it so that people outside of that, a larger audience, can understand it, right? That one's super key. Yeah, and when you're putting it together, you're going to want to add more and more and oh, more yeah, yeah, to it. Yeah. That's like, the point is to try and refine that. Yeah. Scope down. Pitch it to your mum, or your dad, <laughs> or your grandma, or your, you know, someone who knows nothing about games, and if there's a word that they don't understand, take it out. Right. So a really great example of this uh, that Surprise Attack worked on was, ver how, am I pronouncing this right? Vertiginous Gull? Yeah. Yep. I can never it. say it. I did it. Yes. <laughs> um, and the elevator pitch for Vertiginous Golf was a dystopian steampunk mini golf adventure game. Um, all of those words individually uh, and put together, not normal, <laughs> um, but depict something really, really cool and actually got quite a bit of attention at the time. So. Um, you like to say that you don't like bragging about this, yeah. but I love bragging about this. <laughs> um, John Walker, a notorious stickler for, you know, being John Walker, uh, working at Rock Paper Shotgun, uh, gave quite the compliment. Um, you can see here, it's very easy. He gets, he gets hundreds of pitches a day, right? Like any journalist that you're reaching out to, assume they got a thousand elevator pitches that day alone, just assume it. And so what you want is for yours to hit at least strike a chord f to be something that they've never heard before or to describe something that they're in more interested in than the last thing, right? So a new twist on tower defense, eh. Adding a, a free-to-play model to classic racing, eh, whatever. A dystopian steampunk golf game, he's never heard of that before. So it can be difficult, can be very difficult. I'm not saying it's super easy. You're not gonna come up with it like in the shower. Actually, that's not true. I've totally come up with them like brushing my hair in the shower. But uh, you know, it's gonna be a process and something like this workshop is definitely gonna help you get there. Um, oh yeah, Hackett, do you wanna do Hackett? Cause I'm terrible at pronouncing. You Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, that's just I'm trying to pick the word that you're terrible at pronouncing there. Um, so actually we've got Matt, the developer of Hackett here, yeah. superstar in the room. Um, so Hagnet is a terminal-based hacking game where you use real Unix commands. Oh, you just made it sound easy. Yeah. Yeah. And this is actually our show pitch. We use a different pitch on the store, which is actually more focused on the narrative of the game because all the other hacking games at the time, like Uplink, were very mechanically focused and Hacknet's a narrative game. But when we're at shows, we need something a little bit quicker to, to grab people's attentions. And this works really well because our core audience for this game who buy it in the droves is cis admins who go, holy shit, that's my <laughs> job, but fun, right? <laughs> um, and they love that. But it also says one of the key things, which is this is a typing game, not a, uh, Hollywood hacking, although actually we get called Hollywood hacking, but it's not the like, okay, do a little mini game puzzle game. It's a game where you're actually navigating around a computer like you would in real in a real thing. So even though it's not a simulator, it is um, 
you know, it's more closer to actual hacking than any other hacking game that, that's, that was out there at the time. And, um, and it cuts through. And even people that don't understand what Unix is would ask the question, oh, what's Unix? Or do I need to know Unix to play the game? And then you say, no, you don't. You get taught. And it sort of it starts a conversation and is, has always been very effective. OK, next example is my favorite example. Um, it's an example of the say what the fuck version of a um, of an elevator pitch, a split screen shooter where everyone is invisible. And the cool one about the the cool thing about this one is that if you know what a uh, split screen shooter is, it really forces you to wonder why we're doing this, and then immediately you start to think, oh right, that that actually makes total sense. And if you've never heard about any of those things, it still describes the game. So um, screen sheet is a really, really fun example. Have you had, do, do you have any um, cool stories about the creation of this one? Did you go through iterations on this? Uh, no, this one wrote itself. Yeah, cool. Like it just is the game. You, you literally don't need to say anything else and anyone who's ever played GoldenEye understands what this is, why it's cool, why it would be funny. Um, the hardest thing is how you make a trailer from a game yeah. where everyone's invisible. There are no player um, And so we did a lot of live action trailers. We did two live action trailers for this and um, how you make key art when the characters are all invisible. And so there's, there's a whole bunch of things like when you're not just saying it that you need to like communicate in challenging ways. But this, I mean, this is a great example of where like the positioning was there in the design of the game from the start and um, how the game was built around a really great concept yeah. you know it was a game jam title game jam titles are often very good for this because you you end up having to make something based around a concept so you're kind of halfway towards having a good position to start with and these are just examples we'll take you through the nitty-gritty of sort of how to get there in a second here yeah. um cool. cool yeah awesome okay so for the back half of the presentation i'm going to take you through um the actual process itself um the yeah Boring really quick <laughs> um so there would be a lot of information in this so say get the workbook afterwards so that you can you can go through um there's a couple of things that i wanted to take out of this talk if you just walk away with a few things one of them is this which is the journey is more important than the destination this this process is a way of having structured conversations around this this topic, which for developers it can be really useful because you know how to build like a, a your programming plan, you know how to do your art direction, you know how to do a design document. But marketing can often be a thing that kind of feels like, well, I don't really understand how to start on that, yeah. right? So the, the process is really about a formal conversation or a structure to have a conversation. It's the conversation that matters, not the notes you take out afterwards. If you go back to your notes later, you might be like, why did we write? that thing down, right? You, you, it's the thinking that gets improved through the journey. It's the finding insights through, through doing these exercises. Yeah, and, and the idea that you're willing to do it more than once, right? Chris mentioned that at the beginning, you're going to do it more than once over yeah. the span of your game. I would suggest doing it right away first. You're going to see a lot of benefit looking back and seeing the changes and deltas between how you did it at the beginning of the game versus how you do it closer to launch. So do it as many times as you feel like you would benefit from it. That's so we have five exercises. Uh, the first is isn't. This is basically a warm up exercise. It's really just putting down everything the game is, everything the game isn't. Just getting in the process of trying to get stuff out of your head, seeing where that takes you. Competitive variance looks at the different uh, products you'd be compared to and competing against, and it's really focused on that differentiation aspect of, of positioning. Emotional rewards looks at that real value. What is the experience of playing the game? Um, personality is literally, you know, is this a happy game? Is it aggressive? What is the tone? And, and it really affects your assets and how you talk about the game. And the association board is kind of a dumb marketing exercise Super at the end. Super stupid, but it's um, pretty fun. Yeah, it's stupid and it's fun, but it actually sometimes can get the best uh, details. And it's really like if this game was a icy pole, which icy pole would it be? A what? Uh, like an ice <laughs> lolly. I'm just going to use lots of weird Australian what? things. Icy poles are, uh, you know, like, like, a like an ice cream. Yeah, like a popsicle. Like a popsicle. Yeah. Oh, a popsicle. Yes. OK, OK. Yes. Um, icy pole. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> In Canada, an icy pole is a thing you get your tongue stuck to if you put it on there. Yeah. Okay, yeah, it's, our game is not that icy. Okay. Um, yeah, so it's dumb, but it's about connecting things that mean something to you in real life. It's about the nuance, you know, like which superhero is it? Well, is it Batman or is it Superman and why? That conversation, I, I did this for, with the Armello guys about four years ago, and we spent about 40 minutes arguing. I actually don't remember what the answers were in the end, but we spent a long time between that group debating, like, which thing it was. Was it Batman? Um, everything's Batman. Yeah. 
90% of indie games are Batman. I know this empirically. I've done this exercise with about 250 studios. 90% of them are Batman. Um, we'll come on to that at the end. So it's kind of dumb, but actually it, it's really useful. But as I say, like the, the journey through this is, is the most important. So what we're going to do is normally I would do this, be doing this interactively. We'd have an extra hour. We'd, you guys would be spending 10, 15 minutes on each um, exercise. But what we're going to do is show you and share with you our actual notes from Orwell, which is one of our games um, from when we did the positioning workshop from that about a year and a half ago. If you don't know Orwell, it's a surveillance game from a German team, Osmotic Studios. Uh, came out last year as an episodic serial. Um, it was nominated for and won a bunch of awards, uh, including nominations for IGF Narrative. Um, won a bunch of German, German awards and, and other bits and pieces. Um, and I'm going to show you the trailer just so you understand the game um, better. <laughs> Thanks to the government's safety bill, the nation is experiencing the lowest levels of violent crime in years. But there are still those who pose a threat to our peaceful citizens, to all of us. Introducing Orwell, a new security program that combines cutting edge information retrieval with human directed suspect profiling. For Orwell to be truly successful, however, we need you, someone outside of the nation, capable of discerning information posted by suspects online you will have to carefully decide what information is crucial for our investigations. Stakes are high, and lives hang in the balance. Sign up now, and together, we can ensure a safer nation for all. Orwell, keeping an eye on you. So bear that in mind as we go through this, this exercise. That everybody's watching me all the time or that this yeah. is what the game is? Well, both. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so is, isn't, as I said, it's a very simple warm-up exercise. However, when we, do when we do this with studios, we spend about three hours on this workshop. And um, sometimes we spend like half of that time on this exercise because as we dig into getting information out about that game, we just go down rabbit holes and kind of like get more and more information and more and more questions come up. Um, these are some starter items. Don't write these down, they're all in the workbook. Um, but just very simple things. It's just like, what hardware are we making this for? How are we going to sell this? Who's making this? Is there anything about us that we should put in there, like anything specific about us? Um, what control systems are going to be used? What's the objective of the game? What's the moment to moment gameplay? What's the meta gameplay? Um, what sort of skill would I need to play this game and do well? You know, these are just some of them. And anything goes, right? So you don't feel restricted. It's about warming up the team, but it's also about seeing what comes out of this. And some of these questions you might never have asked yourselves. Or sometimes we've done this with groups, and there's five of them in the group, and two of them had vastly different ideas about the game that they were making. And they just never had the conversation yeah. about it. <laughs> Write it all down, though. Yes. And no matter what. Yeah. So here's some examples of what we had for Orwell. Again, I won't go through um, these in too much detail. Um, a few things to pull out that were really critical. Things like you play as yourself um, was really important. Um, the, the fact that um, it's, there's no real gameplay in Orwell, like it's barely a game. Um, you can't win or fail. Like You can cho make choices and there's consequences, so it's definitely interactive, but it's not like... You can, it's not like papers please say where actually you can do well or, or badly. Um, you, it's about moving through a story. Um, it's not a simulator, for example. Um, and this sense that there's a pressure on you, um, which is caused by the fact you're trying to find these, these terrorists, um, as well as being episodic. And at this point, we hadn't worked out the release structure, but we knew we wanted to do something special with the episodic aspect of it. 
Um, the isn't list is tends to be shorter and is more. It's not an opposite of the is. So like, don't waste time right now. Like it's an FPS. It's not a racing game. Like that's not relevant, <laughs> right? But um, if it's an FPS with no guns, oh, that's maybe interesting. So the things that you have chosen specifically not to do, where the where the negative is more important than the positive. Um, so for example, here it's not gameplay skill focused. It's not a simulator. Um, you're not, but you're not from the place that the game is about. Um, obviously, it's inspired by 1984, but it's not an adaptation of 1984, right? These things uh, are important. And this list will always be shorter than, than the positives. Yeah, so that warms you up, gets you thinking about stuff. Um, then you get into the real meaty stuff in competitive variants. Um, if you haven't read it, I encourage everybody to go and read The Purple Cow by Seth Gonan. It's kind of like a classic marketing book. It is 15 years old or something now, which is just crazy. Um, Seth Godin is a marketing kind of guru and blogger, um, was involved in the early days of, of game software back in the 80s and 90s, it was one of his first jobs. He worked at Yahoo for a very long time in the early days as well. Um, obviously all four of these cows are different, but there's one that you notice more than others, which is the purple cow in the bottom corner. Yeah, in case you're colorblind. Yeah, in case you're colorblind, or, and also this... Also, this purple light is not doing anything. No, right there, no. Yeah. no. Yeah. That um, purple. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, and this is very pertinent to, like, imagine this is the games that are coming out, right? Being slightly bigger or slightly smaller or whatever, or having a slightly different pattern doesn't really make you stand out. You need to find what the purple is of the game. What is the thing that you can really stand out from? And um, the concept of Purple Cow, very quickly, is that if the 20th century was, was essentially an industrial advertising-driven um, market where you learned how to make something efficiently and then you spent lots of money to advertise it, the 21st century is not like that at all. Um, we now have a situation with digital um, communication where it's not about you know, controlling advertising. It's about, is your thing remarkable? Are people going to talk about it? Um, movies used to have a good opening week. They now have a good opening session. In fact, it's worse than that. They have a good opening session wherever it's showing first in the world, mm -hmm. right? So some markets before the movie's even out, everybody already knows it's trash, right? So it changes the way that you engage with, with consumers and remarkable products spread like wildfire average mediocre products just sink and that's the nature of the 21st century economy and the purple cow is all about understanding that and thinking about how do you make things that are going to be in that remarkable category um, so how we do this in the exercise is that we first look at what are the games we're going to compare to so what are the inspirations what are the competitors uh, and we throw all of those up in a list and then within that list we start looking at what sort of categories of games you know so for Orwell we had games that were narrative exploration, right? Where we were basically saying, like, you're basically what you're doing in the game is exploring a story. So like, her story is probably the best example of this. Um, Gone Home is another game um, very much in that, that basically the core of the game is just engage with this story, but you're, you're discovering it. Then we had games that were about moral decisions. So Papers, Please and Westport Independent were big inspirations here. Most of the Telltale games, like the Walking Dead games, are essentially about moral decisions. Um, putting the player in a position where they need to make that decision. We had Need to Know, which is a game from Adelaide that's, that's still unreleased at this point, um, but is the other big surveillance game that was coming at the time. Uh, and we had visual novels and detective games like Ace Attorney, because effectively you're, you're kind of doing a detective job in the game. So for each of these categories, we need to compare our game separately. There's no point comparing to Papers, Please and Her Story, because they're vastly different categories of games. Right? So the exercise that we did, we, we do multiple times. And the exercise is essentially thinking about your game uh, and putting information into these four quadrants. So more, less, different, and new. Wow, well, this really purple bad. is really wait, not wait, standing wait, wait, out. Wait, 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 wait. Maybe if I do... It is in presentation mode. No, Whoa. it just makes it. No, uh, no, that's good. Oh, that's... Better? It's not really better. It's not better. To... Oh, we've got a... There's yeah, just so I don't many know. wonderful buttons up. It's too much power for any one person, truly. The what? Oh, yeah, just turn the purple lights off. Yeah. Oh, just unplug them? Wow. wow. <laughs> there you go. Wow. <laughs> Turns out. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I don't know how well the mic's working. Okay, so here's how it works. More and less, basically, is for this category of game, what do I expect to see? So if it's a racing game, there's going to be vehicles. If it's a shooter, there's going to be guns. Uh, if it's a platform game, there's going to be platforms. 
Um, there's going to be puzzles, there's going to be hazards, etc. Right. So for that category, think about the 10 or 12 things that you expect to find. And does your game have more or less than what you would expect to find? Right. So are you Gran Turismo of, of racing or are you Outrun? You know, um, are you, you know, if you're talking about a, a simulator racing game, are you super accurate, again, like a Forza or a Gran Turismo, or are you like at the Mario Kart end of the, of the racing, That's like physics, right? Super realistic. Yeah. I think offense. Yeah. yeah. Plus banana physics. Yeah. Um, so this is, you know, and this is not a place that indies play. Like, you no, will very, very rarely find an indie game <laughs> differentiating on more or less. This is AAA. This is like Borderlands saying, we've got infinite guns in our thing. It's Forza saying, we've got more accurate cars. You know, because this is about production values more than anything else that allow you to do this. Um, where you can sometimes play is in the less space, where you're like, it's this super complex genre, and you know what? We stripped out everything but this one thing, right? But typically, you're not really playing there. In the different box goes anything that you expect to find with a twist. Okay, so it could be. <laughs> sorry, I can never do this without thinking of the robot chicken. Yeah. <laughs> like um, so uh, yeah, so maybe it's an RPG. So I've got a class system, but I've got a twist on that class system. You know, or I mean, a great game from Kit Fox just got announced, yeah. um, Boyfriend Dungeon, which is basically it's a it's a classic like isometric dungeon, but you get to date your weapons. Yeah. Right. Oh. Um, so it's both it's both a, a twist on that and a twist on the typical dating game um, genre as well. Right. So it's stuff that you expect to find, but also with, with something fresh. It could be the theme of the game. It could be like an RPG that's set in an office and all the tasks are about, you know, um, completing things for your boss or whatever. Right. Um, again, it's mechanics that, you know, but in a completely different setting um, could be the art style. Like, you know, it's like Cuphead. It's, yeah. it's, it's a typical old school platform shooter, but an amazingly different art style, right? In the new box goes anything that just hasn't been seen before. So like maybe you're Minecraft and you're inventing a new, whole new genre. Um, maybe you're Call of Duty and you're stealing all the RPG mechanics of RPGs to put into online shooters, right? So you might be taking something from one genre, putting it into a category that's never seen that before. And that goes into the new box. Yeah, you're going to find, um, at least when I do this exercise, when I look back, there's a lot of um, overlap between different and new, or what you thought was new, or what you thought was different and actually is the other. Don't worry about that too much. Just get it all down. Like, if you think it's different, put it in different. If you think it's new, put it in new. Doesn't You don't have to, like, go research, did anyone else release a game exactly like the one I'm thinking about yeah. right now? Yeah. And what you're doing is you're looking for what feels purple like what is <laughs> what is the thing that we can actually hang our hat on um, what is the thing that you can push the hardest and not just at this point this is not just a marketing exercise or a promotional exercise it's also a design exercise yeah. right what you should be looking for here is do we have anything that actually <laughs> is worth talking about and if not maybe we shouldn't make this game or maybe we should think about what we need to do or maybe we have this cool you know what you know what, we have this um, different thing. We're dating our weapons. OK, well, let's go spend a lot more on that. Let's spend a lot more of the dev time on that and not worry about how many levels we're making, right, or how many characters there are. Because no one's going to care that there's 20 levels instead of 15. But if we really dive into this point of difference, people will care about that. Yeah, this is sort of where you start to see that symbiotic relationship between the marketing aspect of this and the design aspect of it. It's right around this point that you realize you know, how you position, how you think about your game is going to affect how you develop the game, but also how you're developing the game is going to affect how you position the game. It, it becomes really seamless around here. Yeah. yeah, and at this point in the development, you're asking yourself the harder questions. What does my difference mean for the end audience? Am I being different for different sake because I want to make a platformer game? Or does it actually have real impact to the end play yeah. experience? And it's brutal, but this is actually a good exercise for making that hard call of killing your darlings. Mm -hmm. Because it's really hard to have that conversation, particularly in a team. But if you do this exercise and you're like, yeah, there's, there's nothing here that we can really justify um, as standing out, it's a good reason to then kill and move on to something else. Um, I'm not going to go through too much of the details for Orwell um, because of time. But essentially, this for narrative exploration, which was those her story kind of games, we had a number of different differences. Um, a lot of that was around the theme of the medium of the internet. Um, a lot of it was around the, just the amount of world building that was there. Um, but the stuff that came through the strongest was this idea that it's a story about modern society that we all live in. We all have to deal with this concept of surveillance. We, we you know, it's not like. Um, 
her story that's like a great sort of detective story but really doesn't have any resonance with, with your life. Um, and just like the modern modernness of it and the topicality of it was really important. Um, games in, which put you in a position of power, again, similar things came through. Critically here, it was a much more morally gray game than something like Papers, Please, where you know what the right thing to do is, but you're torn between, do I do the right thing for this person or do I look after my family? And what does it mean to be in that position? In Orwell, you could argue the case for most of the different choices that could be sort of seen as morally right. Um, and this idea that essentially um, we didn't want people to be told what was the right decision, but to use the game to explore what they thought the right thing to do would be. Um, but you get the idea. There's actually not as many things on this as we normally end up with in these, in these um, exercises. And you'll start to see your, theme, your themes are really linked. So Orwell was first and foremost inspired by something that was sort of happening in our daily lives. So that was what the team was inspired by. So therefore, it becomes a little bit more morally grey as they play through because they're inspired by something yeah. that's kind of happening out there in real life. Yeah, and because the theme was probably the strongest thing that came through this, most of our marketing focuses on the theme and not the mechanics or how exactly you play the game, right? Okay, so emotional reward, if you think back to those, uh, those two videos, uh, each of which was, was very much pushing a particular emotion, emotional reward. We have, I think there are 16, I always lose count, that we have developed, essentially, we invented empathy and uh, discovery. <laughs> um, and for each one of these, your game has a score, on a scale, whatever scale you want to make it. We typically use an out of 10 scale when we come to write it up because it's easy to graph. Uh, you can use low, mid, high, number of stars. It doesn't matter. It's your scale. There's no empirical measure of you know, creation in a game. right? Um, so what, what makes sense to you? Um, in the workbook, you'll find descriptions for each of these. Um, I'll go through what we got for Orwell and quickly describe each one as, as we go. Um, we only have about 10 minutes left, so I don't want to dwell too much on them. But essentially, you're, you're marking your game out of 10 um, or on a similar scale, and you're looking for here, like, what are the strongest aspects, right? There's no good or bad to this. It's not like you want all of them to be maxed out, because that would be horrendous. Um, it's really, what are the things? And also thinking about, for my competitive games or my genre, what are the things that drive the players that want to play this kind of game, right? So reward, we're going to go from bottom to top because that's the way PowerPoint likes to do things. Um, this is about intrinsic versus extrinsic rewards. Okay, so intrinsic is I think this is good. Extrinsic is someone telling me it's good. Right. So in games, that's like a nice sound when you click on a button, or some gold coins, or some stars, or the end of a peggle level. Um, you know, social casual games like Farmville do this all the time. But it's sort of Pavlovian in a way, but it's like hey, you did this thing, I want you to do more of that thing, so I'm going to reward you with something that makes you feel good about doing that thing. Um, whereas intrinsic games like um, Proteus, for example, it's like, or Gone Home, there's not really any reaction to you as the player as such. There's no score, there's no, um, you've done well. It's just experience this thing. So Orwell's definitely on the intrinsic end. Um, the only extrinsic stuff in there was really that as you drag a data chunk across, you get some more information and you get a kind of a reaction from the game. But you can't do well, you can't do better than someone else. It's really about the game in your head is, do I feel comfortable with what I just did? Right, so you're kind of keeping score yourself. Um, Relaxation, is the game intense like Dark Souls or Call of Duty, or is it relaxing like a crossword puzzle, essentially? Um, that, is, that is the dichotomy, yeah. for sure, yeah. yeah. Um, crossword, yeah. yeah. Um, waiting for that Dark Souls-themed crossword yeah. game. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so relaxing games tend to be turn-based, no pressure, no threat, etc. And obviously games that are not relaxing are going to have lots of pressure on you to play and, and be exciting. Um, reflection, Orwell was off the chart for this, this is what the game was all about. I'm playing the game and I'm thinking about my life and my life choices and, and I'm thinking about the themes in the game, right? Um, a game like Bejeweled would be very low on this, um, maybe thinking about your life choices if you're spending two hours <laughs> playing it, but, but not really thinking about, you know, global geopolitical themes as a result of, of playing it, right? Obviously, Papers, Please, any game that was like position of power tends to be high on this, right? Um, mastery, it had no mastery. Um, mastery is basically, can I get better at the game and will I do better if I get better? So chess is at the infinite end of this scale, roulette is at the other end of the scale. You can never get better at roulette. 
There's, there's no skill in, in Orwell, so it's at zero. Joy, how happy is the game? Is it Candy Crush Saga? Is it Dark Souls? Um, this was on the Dark Souls end. Um, there's very little um, positivity in it all. Well, it's pretty depressing. It, it's what we like to call our existential dread category of games. It's something we really love at Surprise Attack. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, growth, there's no growth. So growth is essentially, think of RPGs or SimCity. I took an acorn, I made it into a tree. You know, over 200 hours, I build up this character or I build up my world or I build up my town or whatever. Um, Farmville is another one for this. Oh, well, nothing changes in, in that respect, so it's zero. Frustration, it was also zero. Uh, Candy Crush Saga is a great example of this, and it's basically the gambling emotion, right? I nearly won, so I'm going to keep playing. Um, you know, Candy Crush does this perfectly. It makes you fail like 20 times before you get a chance to succeed, and then you're like, oh, wow, I did so well succeeding, you know? Um, again, Orwell was designed to be very low on this. We didn't want anyone to get blocked or stuck. Um, puzzle games tend to be higher because they want you to feel that sort of that pressure and, and difficulty. Fear, um, so think again of horror games, etc. Um, fear was reasonably high for Orwell because uh, you fear for the characters at certain points and you just also fear for society by the time you finish playing the game. <laughs> um, excitement was, um, even though the game was very, was, you know, um, not necessarily lots of pressure on you and, and it's not necessarily intense in terms of action. There's a few moments which are in real time uh, and those are really exciting um, moments because you feel like as you're doing stuff and seeing things happen in the world, essentially. Yeah, it doesn't um, have to be high-paced in order to be yeah. exciting. Yeah. But the top end of this are games like Call of Duty, Burnout, anything that's high adrenaline that you're playing for that rush, right? Again, low games would be crosswords, puzzle games, etc. I would have put escapism way lower for our well. For our well. Yeah, so escapism tends to be... Um, What's interesting as well is we did this like before we shipped the game, so we'd only played about two thirds of the game at, right. or a third of the game at that point. Uh, escapism is like, is this a world that I can dive into? Something like Skyrim, Breath of the Wild. I can really immerse myself in this. In this, or it could be that you're this like little puzzle game, that, and really the reason why you play Bejeweled is to escape from your boring day job or uh, the troubles of the world, or, or thinking about all the terrible things that Orwell made you think when you were playing. <laughs> so. Um, Again, you do not want to escape to the world of Orwell. Although it's quite rich as a world, it's not a place you go to escape from this world. Uh, empowerment. So um, think about games like World of Tanks or Prototype. Um, Dynasty Warriors is my classic here. Dynasty Warriors is built around empowering 12-year-old boys during puberty. And uh, it's all about like wading through masses of people to, to feel like you're this invincible soldier. It, I worked on the titles as, as marketing. and. Sometimes we would just leave the controller alone. Nobody attacks the player. Every so often someone prods them. You can literally like not play that game and not die. And that's because it's not built to be a realistic combat game. It's built to make the player feel powerful, right? Um, low games on this would be um, anything where you, you feel super weak, um, like a survival game before you have any equipment um, or just games that like, again, a crossword or whatever is going to be low on this. Orwell was pretty p empowering, even though you're trapped. Um, you know, it's pretty powerful. I just love this dichotomy of, of crosswords. <laughs> yeah. of crosswords yeah. to Dark Souls. I'm well, look, really I'm sure. Video games. On yeah. a scale of crosswords to Dark Souls, where are you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's five crosswords out of, yeah, right, out right. of Dark yeah, Souls. Seven out of ten Dark Souls, yeah. 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 Empathy, other characters here that I can connect with. Do I, do I like, see myself in them? Or do I, you know, like a great TV show, like a madman or whatever. Like a game that's high in empathy will have those characters. Like David Cage's whole career has been trying to have, like, high empathy <laughs> games and basing it around that, right? I like your use of trying. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's a hard thing to do. He said it. He said it. Um, okay. Discovery is my personal favorite emotional reward. Um, this is a couple of different things. So imagine a game like Breath of the Wild or Red Dead Redemption. I'm literally discovering and uncovering the map, like particularly in Breath of the Wild. They do it so well. And finding stuff. I know the developer put there, but it still feels like you know, no one else has found it and I've just stumbled across it, right? Um, or it could be, um, this game is not telling me what I have to do. I have no idea how to play this game and I figured it out and aren't I smart, right? <laughs> so puzzle games can be quite high on this when, they, when they're reasonably free form, right? Low discovery games are games that say, here are the five things you have to do, now go and do them, right? And it's just A to B, kill everybody in, in between. 
creation. Uh, so think about games like Minecraft, anything where you create as part of the game. Um, so, you know, I built this thing, it's awesome, you know. Um, it's even SimCity or Civilization, I've created my civilization, right? I've crafted it over time. And then uh, something like a Bejeweled or a puzzle game or a shooter, like, is the opposite of this. Or well, didn't really have any creation. It was high on discovery, so just jumping back, because it's a detective game, so you feel like you're uncovering information and finding stuff out about people and tracking people down. Uh, connection is Goldeneye, right? So it's that this is not really a game, it's a social lubricant. Um, it's having fun with my friends, it's, it's a boys night in as, the, as that ad was trying to pitch, um, or it's hanging out with my guild mates in World of Warcraft and paying Blizzard heaps of money every month because it's really just where we hang out, right? It does the same thing as going to the pub or going to watch a football match, it's just games happens to be the medium of this. Right? So local multiplayer games, online multiplayer games, anything like a, a MMO, super high on this. Um, all well, zero on connection, really. Uh, actually, it was, a little uh, bit, yeah. it was a little bit higher. Yeah, I would so, argue. So the idea with this was really for one particular group of people, we wanted to create connection, which was people discussing the game um, in between the episodes. So the episodes came out weekly, and what we wanted to do was foster this community that would be hanging out for what was going to happen yeah. next and be... And theorizing what was going to happen. And this actually happened for us during the, um, the, the release uh, window of the game, but um, most people have never had that experience because only about 10% of people played it during the first um, five weeks. Most people have played it when the game was out. Um, competition is anything competitive. So um, eSports, titles, League of Legends, um, Rocket League, they're super high on human-to-human -human competition. Obviously Orwell was zero on that. Um, collection, think Pokemon, think Mario 64. Um, I'm playing this game to collect the things. When I've collected all the things, ironically, I'll stop playing the game, right? Um, and, and anything where there's like 10 slots and you've got to fill all those slots will drive up um, collection. Again, all world had zero collection. And accomplishment, the last one, is essentially think of a game where you're playing it for 50 hours, like a Skyrim, and you achieve something at the end. So it feels like you did something even though it was just a video game, yeah. right? And you're going to see, like, um, a lot of these feel really adjacent. Like, reward and accomplishment feel like they're really adjacent, but there are plenty of games that have high reward and low accomplishment. I mean, Bejeweled, for example, but high, you know, accomplishment and low reward is, that, that to me is Dark Souls, right? Yeah. Like, on the scale of those two things. But, um, yeah, so don't be, con if you feel like they're the same, try to, try to separate them in your head a little bit, because I guarantee you every one of these is different than the, than the others, so... And like for this slide, the key takeaway here is it's the discussion that you'll have. What does connection mean yeah. in terms of Orwell? You're not, you're not, this isn't going to be a quick journey. You're going to be in that room for an hour having these discussions and what it means for your yeah. game and why. As well as like sometimes we'll be playing, we'll be doing this rather with, um, with a game and we'll be like, geez, your genre is usually driven by collection, but you're thinking it's low. Yeah. Hmm. Like either that's a really great point of difference or you're going to have a whole lot of people that are disappointed in your, in your game, right? Um, so it can be really useful to think about it that way as, as well as thinking about, okay, if empathy and empowerment and reflection are the main things, how do we dial that up? How do we double down on those things um, that are driving that? And let's not worry about mastery or joy or... Um, some of the other aspects that really aren't going to be the things that you, you notice in the game. Okay, we are running really out of time, so we're going to be quick here. So personality is really simple. Um, think back to the Apple ad and how they personified the, the, the two different brands. Um, really just thinking about your game, here's some starting words. Again, these are in the workbook, so you really don't need to write them down. But um, is the game loud? Is it quiet? Is it... Um, Aggressive? Is it welcoming? Uh, is it standoffish, like something like Dark Souls or Daisy? Um, is it super punishing, like yeah. that? Right. And what and what you want is for the tone of your marketing assets and the way you talk about the game to be consistent with the personality of the game. You, you couldn't make a comedy trailer for Dark Souls and have that work, right? You, you could make it, but it would be so <laughs> against the personality of the game that it would be very problematic, right? Whereas something like PUBG is is a pretty comedic weird game, so they their tone of voice needs to be a little bit more um, crazy and not sort of super serious, right? Yeah. Here's what we had for Orwell. I won't go through this too much. The, the one thing I want you to take away from this slide is 
you totally don't have to write down personality words. You can write down anything that you think of. So like every single data point is a real person with real feelings is obviously a very popular and common personality trait. Um, you know, contra characters contrast with the system is the same. So these this were things that came out of thinking about the personality that we wrote down. Yeah, and a really cool thing, remember when, earlier when we said you can lie in your elevator pitch, um, as long as you know the difference between your elevator pitch and, and the consistency but, you know, between it or the inconsistency between it and these personality traits, you know sort of what to say later. So like even if you are misleading, like if, if you were to make a comedy trailer for Dark Souls, you have to recognize that it is different from the, con from the actual personality of Dark Souls in order to then give them the real pitch later or the more detailed pitch. So. Yeah. Yeah, and you can see if you think back to the trailer, there's some of these personality traits come through, the clinical aspect of it, the utilitarian, cold and emotional way that the, the voiceover is, is done and just a very straightforward um, aspect of it, for example. Um, association board, again, so we went through this. It's very simple. Uh, if my game was a lolly, uh, what would it be? Again, I'm just <laughs> picking these to confuse Phoenix. Uh, if it was a musical style, if it was a superhero. And your mileage will vary with these depending on what your own knowledge is, right? So I typically, when I go around and do this with, with groups, some, there's always one person that is a car nerd and they'll give me a specific model of a specific car from a specific year. And everyone else is just like, I don't, I don't know, like Hummer or VW Beetle. Like, it, again, it's just what connection do you make? There's always a comic book nerd that picks a weird one and everyone else picks Batman. Yeah. And, and the reason why Batman works is that Batman means so many different things that everybody knows Batman, right? So it, people, Everyone's Batman, but they're all Batman for different mm -hmm. reasons, yeah, that's right? A huge part. And so you just pick the ones that make sense to you. Like, don't really stress around. Oh my God, I've got to really pick the right car. It doesn't matter what car you pick. What matters is that you write down the reason you picked the car, not so much the car that you picked. If you, if you see. So uh, we didn't actually do this for Orwell, but we did it for another game called Puzzle Retreat from Melbourne team Voxel Agents, and we did this exercise with them and actually helped them choose the name, and it affected a whole bunch of things about the game. They wanted the game to feel like this retreat from the world, that escapism was a really high emotional reward for them, right? And um, this idea of like a 1960s luxurious retreat, um, all very natural and sort of pre-technology. Um, so a lot of the things that came out... Batman. Um, yeah, Batman. In fact, there's two Batmans on this one. They Could doubled you know, on Batman. Batman. Um, and uh, yeah, so you can see that in some of the, the things here, like the luxurious food, like the chocolate, Nigella Lawson, this like indulgence, like playing Puzzle Retreat was going to be an so indulgence. David yeah, so David Attenborough. Um, some things on here I literally cannot remember, like why is there a cinema? Um, <laughs> and ratatouille, I think it is, or soup. But you know, so what you do is once you have the words, you go and do a Google image search and you create a slide like this and you put it on the wall and you can then remember things, hopefully. Um, this is like five years ago that we did this. Um, and it should hopefully inspire and make connections, right? But again, it's the connections that make sense to you, not necessarily random person that sees the, the slide, right? Um, so that is the exercise. As I say, we rattled through that a lot. Um, if anyone doesn't have the link, grab the link now because I'm about to click off the slide. Um, oh, hey, I'm quite finished yet. So... <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow, chill. Yeah, yeah. chill. Um, I will do an encore. Um, but, uh, so just remember, the point of positioning is differentiation, understanding the real value, understanding your personality. What you do with that after you've done that exercise yeah. is you develop key messages. What are the six things that we want to communicate? Not the six sentences that will be the key features on the store page, but the six things I want to say about the game. Right? And that then helps you build the elevator pitch. Um, so I'll give you an example of where we got to on Orwell. Our elevator pitch was this, Big Brother has arrived and it's you. And this took a huge amount of crafting. Um, Drew and I, Drew's our comms manager, on the way back from Avcon, spent about 10 hours talking about this after a whole bunch of other work and sat in a McDonald's like an hour or two out of Melbourne and finally wrote this down. And in one tiny sentence, it communicates everything you need to know about the game. The crux of the game is if you were the person behind the camera, what would you do? If you had this information and no one else did, would you put it on their record or not? Um, it linked to, to 1984. It said it's, it's modern. It communicated that you were the player. Um, and it's intriguing. Like this concept, it's different, it's new. There's not another game that does this. We then expanded that out. For example, this is what it looks like on Steam. Um, we then, so we then explained 
what you actually did in the game. All right? We didn't have to do that in the elevator pitch because the, the concept is intriguing enough. But then you need to explain to people what this actually looks like. In easy to understand terms. And yes, the easy to understand terms is what's critical. The, the, last, the middle section of this, like information from the internet, personal communications, private files, we wanted to shorten that because you only have so, so many characters to work with. But every time we shortened it, we realized that people weren't going to necessarily understand the term that we were putting in there, like electronic information or like we had all these different phrases. And in the end, we just went, no, we just got to explain it in actually literally what, what it is yeah. um, so that we could communicate that clearly to people. Yeah, and an elevator pitch, once you hear it, always sounds like the most obvious things in the world, but I promise you that the majority of games go through these many hours of an iteration of a project like this, like of an exercise like this, to get to that extremely obvious uh, pitch at the end. Yep. Cool. So that is now done, and we can take questions in the no. one minute that we have. Literally 60 seconds. Three minutes. Oh, my God. Three minutes. Three whole minutes. No, okay. <laughs> I don't know if there's a mic, but uh, there's a question over there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's probably the one, oh, one or two. <laughs> okay. Um, I have been actually been thinking about that because obviously it's done Same. so incredibly well. Um, nostalgia is one emotional reward that I don't have on the board because it's it's sort of and so that can be a big thing. It's like hey, games you used to play as a kid, so like Thimbleweed Park would be high on that. Yeah, exactly. That could be part of it. Um, it's. I mean, obviously, there's all the skill and everything else that goes into Cuphead. It's like it's a high mastery game it's, and so on. But, yeah, the aesthetic is sort of like just a sense of design appreciation or... Um, you want to be so careful, yeah. like, saying that, like... I mean, lots of games are beautiful for lots of different reasons. And so um, if you hit your, your market with every other aspect of a project, like a, a workbook like this, then hopefully the people that see your game as well and just like the aesthetic will come to it. But you've done a good enough job messaging what the game actually is to make them buy the game, right? Because it's never enough to just have a good aesthetic. I mean, I'm going to say that. Maybe it is. But, like, yeah. work under the understanding that it's not enough to just have a beautiful game. Work on every other aspect aspect and then also focus on having something beautiful yeah. so yeah Cuphead I mean Cuphead definitely lives and breathes by its aesthetic that's really about differentiation more than emotional yeah. reward right the, the other emotional reward on something like Cuphead that's got hype behind it is the hype it's the you know everyone is talking about this game it is such a tentpole game like Rocket League was that thing for me yeah. right everyone like Matt freaking got me into it at, the, at PAX West a couple of years ago. We were literally playing it in the house, and I was like, well, I have to buy this because this is what we're all talking about, yeah. right? Um, indie games don't often get to do that because it's rare that you break through to that level of awareness. But a game like Cuphead, the reason why it sells a million units is because it's in that category where it got elevated to that point where everyone had to play it because it was such a big thing. It's hard to, it's super hard to yeah. get into that category, right? Um, yeah, focus yeah. on the rest. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, I mean, we'll probably be outside for like 20 minutes, half an hour. So if people have questions, happy to um, share them or ask us questions on Twitter uh, or me, I guess. Yeah, it's up I there. Cool.